Good evening. Welcome to our final event in our Hagen Center lineup this year, um, Diversity Dialogues. It's been a great season and I've appreciated all of you who have followed us all this season. We're excited about next year's work and we're getting started on that. And before we get started tonight, I do want to thank a few people and a few organizations that have helped us out significantly this year. The first individual I would like to thank, you see his name maybe on all of these Zoom calls is Jonathan Glover for the amazing he work he's done to make sure that all of these events get broadcast correctly to the very best visibility and that making sure that people have access. He's also the person who moderates the chat to make sure that we get to ask our guests all the questions. I'd also like to thank our media partner, Spokane Public Radio, for their support this season. Our president at Spokane Community College, Kevin Brockbank, for his undying support of this effort, and also our chancellor, Dr. Christine Johnson. I'd also like to thank the entire Hagen Center Advisory Committee for their support of these events and planning them and executing them. And it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce committee member and wonderful colleague, Charlie Martin, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Fabulous, thank you very much, Gwen. Um, on behalf of uh, Spokane Community College, SCC and the Hagen Center for Humanities, I welcome you to our diversity dialogues. Um, with the words for these dialogues, I see you, I hear you, and I feel you. We encourage you to collectively sit down together, all of us at the same table simultaneously, to engage in dialogue about race, about diversity, and most importantly, about equity. Um, we always encourage audience participation. If you would like to share questions, as Gwen said, of our guests this evening, please type them in the comments and uh, Jonathan will share them with us. If you're not logged on to social media, you can email your questions very simply to sec.hagencenter at sec.spokane.edu. Again, that's sec.hagen center, which is two A's in Hagen, at sec.spokane.edu. So our moderators will forward these and make sure we get as many questions. Um, we're, we begin by acknowledging that we present this program from the traditional lands of the Spokane, Colville, Kalispell, and Okanagan people who have stewarded this land for generations. Um, this presentation is uh, you're about to enjoy is part of the Humanities Washington Speaker Series. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparking conversation and critical thinking. It provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people throughout the state of Washington each year. And thanks to the support for the National Endowment for Humanities, the Washington Secretary of State, the Thomas S. Foley Institute of Public Policy and Public Service at WSU, and many private donors, Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau presenters visit all corners of our state. I would encourage you to visit their website at www.humanities.org to find other events just like this one. Um, a note about civil discourse. You know, the Speakers Bureau program was designed to generate an open and honest conversation about many pop, um, topics, um, some which may be controversial and some that we had to live through for many years. We encourage you um, differing perspectives. Uh, we understand you have differing viewpoints, but we ask that you treat this topic, this speaker and each other always in your life with respect and dignity. Um, please join me this evening in welcoming Omari Amili. Omari, earned a, batch, a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Washington at Tacoma. We're talking about master's degree here. His research focused on the benefits of college education of formerly incarcerated people. 2018, he was named a distinguished alumni by Pierce College, also at Kamenu College, and has been featured in the Seattle Times, the News Tribune. Um, Amelia is an author, he's a community leader, and he's worked with S South Seattle College the ACLU of Washington and civil survival. Blending his personal story, his scholarship and his life, Omari will lead us in a discussion on the benefits of following another past, the prison, the college pipeline, where the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people can take college courses and receive their degree, whether it be at associates, bachelors or masters, or even doctorate, as Omari will tell you. Studies have shown that education is one of the best ways to reduce the chance of returning to prison. And Omari not only shows us that it's true, he explores how we all benefit, not only the people that were incarcerated, but all of us as individuals and society as a whole here in the state of Washington. 
from a new perspective, a sense of direction, and the self-confidence that education provides. Omari, welcome, and thank you for spending time with us here. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate the introduction. I am glad to be here with you all once again. We have another presentation this morning, so it's exciting to be able to engage with a little bit of um, different audience here in the evening. You guys could be doing anything right now, You'd be eating dinner, spending time with family out, and I don't know if it's sunny where you are, it's sunny where I am, um, out enjoying the nice weather that we have right now, but you're here with us, so I really thank you for setting time aside this evening. This presentation is titled From Crime to the Classroom, How Education Changes Lives, and in a few short moments, you'll hear about why someone like me is interested in a presentation topic like that. You know, it's, it's not just about something that I've read in books or that I studied in school. It's actually very personal for me. It's about my lived experience. And, you know, there's a lot of other people who have similar lived experiences. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now so that we can get into the presentation. Okay. So in this presentation tonight, first, um, you'll meet the speaker, which is myself. I share my story with you all. So that you can hear, you know, what motivates me to talk about such a topic, not only what motivates me, but also what qualifies me. We'll also talk about topics such as mass incarceration, um, reentry, which is when an individual serves time in prison and releases and returns to society. We'll get into identity and societal impacts of that. Um, FICGN, that's the Formerly Incarcerated College Graduates Network. We'll talk about the impact of post-secondary education on formerly incarcerated people. And we'll also get into um, some new local developments that have played a role in, in these trajectories going from prison to college, and then also what it looks like going forward. But first, let's go ahead and just jump right in and meet the speaker. So my name is Omari Amili. Um, my educational journey began, well, it didn't begin. It obviously began way back in pre-K, kindergarten, but my higher ed journey began at Pierce College um, in 2008. There in two, I graduated in 2011, earning an Associate of Arts in Human Services and Substance Abuse. After that, I transferred to the University of Washington, Tacoma, where I double majored, earning a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, and also another Bachelor of Arts in what's called Interdisciplinary Studies with the concentration, Recording in progress. With the concentration on Self and Society. After undergrad, I went into grad school at UW Tacoma, where I earned a Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, where my research focus was preventing recidivism through post-secondary education. So I was taking a look at um, my personal experiences and you know things that I've been through in my life and how I was able to overcome that and still succeed in college. So to, tonight, I'm gonna share with you guys my upbringing and the impacts of that upbringing and ways in which that I defied the odds. So I was born March 23rd, 19, 1985. My family lived in the Central District of Seattle at the time. And at the time of my birth, you know, it was a strong two-parent household. My parents had their stuff together. They were both working. So we had two incomes coming in. We had a solid roof over our head, food on the table, clothes on our back. Everything was good you know, at the time that I was born. Unfortunately, being born in the mid 80s, you know, that's the same time that crack cocaine began wrecking havoc to the black community. A lot of strong two-parent households like the one that I described, once this drug entered the household, a lot of that strength was taken away. You know, the drugs really ate at the foundation of a lot of families, and my family was not able to shake that. So it started as a two-parent house. It slowly began to deteriorate to the point where within five years of my birth, you know, my parents had a lot of problems in their marriage. And they decided that they were going to get divorced. When my parents made the decision to get divorced, my dad decided that he was going to be a transient, which meant that he was homeless. He wasn't working, had no income, you know, was in no position to provide. But although he made the decision to be a transient, he still wanted to be a part of his kids' lives. He didn't want to just be someone who was off the grid and never spoke to his kids. So Although we lived mostly with our mom, there were times when me and my sisters would end up with my dad, sometimes with permission, sometimes without permission. But, you know, it put us in a lot of bad situations. One of the things that we'd have to do when we were with my dad in order to have food to eat was like walk around the U District of Seattle panhandling, asking people for spare change, you know, in order to get some food and bus fare. 
We might go into a pizza restaurant, ask were there any mistakes made or any pizzas that someone might have ordered and didn't pick up that they could give us. And, you know, this this was what we had to do in order to eat when we were with my dad. And, you know, being out on the streets with him being homeless, he didn't have a house where we could go visit him. It was like always an adventure, always going somewhere. And sometimes we would just hop on the bus like, you know, it's cold and rainy in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle especially. So there'll be times that we have to hop on the bus and ride from one end of the route to the other end of the route, you know, just to stay warm and dry. You know, we had experiences such as, you know, we can't find anywhere to sleep at night after knocking on some doors. You know, one of my dad's friends would allow us to sleep in the car in front of his house. You know, we also experienced things like eating at the Union Gospel Mission um, and other like homeless kitchens where a lot of homeless people eat. So when I was with my dad, because of his decision to be a transient, to never work again after him and my mom got divorced because he felt like he'd pretty much be a slave to the system. He didn't want to go to work, just have his checks taken away. You know, because of that decision he made, it made it where me and my sisters, when we were with him, we went through a lot of adverse childhood experiences. On the other hand, when we were with our mom, you know, our mom ended up remarrying someone else who had a crack cocaine addiction. So although she ended up, she left that relationship with my dad because of whatever had took place and the introduction to crack cocaine and all the damage it had done, the decision she made was to end up marrying somebody else who had that same crack cocaine addiction. So this led to situations where all of our houses that we would live in, you know, if we weren't in homeless shelters or places that were closely monitored, they would be drug houses, crack houses, you know, where there was nonstop traffic from drug users and drug dealers and, you know, people who really were up to no good, you know, a lot of gang activity and things like that. And there's a lot that comes with that. When your house is full of drug traffic and gang activity, one of the things that comes along with that is drug busts. So police actually kicking in the door in the middle of the night with guns drawn, running through the house, trying to get the gang members and the drug dealers and the so-called bad guys. And they don't really care that there's little kids in this house on the other side of this door. You know, they're still going to kick that door in and come in with guns drawn. So for a little kid, that's a real scary situation to be in. Another thing that comes along with a lot of gang activity, you know, back in the 90s, it still happens today, but back then it was it was very, very common in a lot of neighborhoods. It's like drive-by shootings, you know, where somebody would actually drive by our house and fill our house up with bullets. You know, they're doing this because they feel like someone from a rival gang or one of their enemies was in the house. And once again, they don't really care that there's young kids there. You know, if a kid ends up getting hit, the bullets don't really have any name on it. So it's just, it's just part of the game that they play, I guess. Um, so I was in a lot of dangerous situations at a young age, a lot of adverse childhood experiences, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the Kaiser Permanente study, you know, they looked at 10 different adverse childhood experiences and the impact that that can have across someone's lifespan. But, you know, they limited it to 10 adverse childhood experiences. I say I'd experienced more like 30 to 50 different ones that were not ever considered by that study. And, you know, that study was aimed at a lot of middle, middle class white people, you know, who might not have experienced a lot of the stuff that I went through. Um, so I say that to say my ACES score would be off the charts. So when I went, um, my dad is pretty messed up. When I went, my mom is pretty messed up. My character is being shaped um, at a real young age, really in not the best way. You know, I'm not quite being provided for, not being cared for, not being parented, you know, because addiction had taken over their values and their behaviors and their actions and it consumed their time. And, you know, like my parents, when they're getting high, they might spend hours and hours and hours locked in their room. They might end up just leaving, you know, going out on a binge with their friends and we don't see them for a long period of time. So it was, it was real ugly when I'm with my parents. So after my mom and God, my, my mom and dad got divorced, we had moved to Portland Stayed there for a few years, I think like three to five years. And then we had moved back to Seattle. This was in 1995 when I was about nine years old. And I started hanging with my older cousins who were a few to several years older than me. My older cousins, you know, they lived in the central district of Seattle and they were already doing things that I wasn't doing. At, at nine years old, when I lived in Portland, even despite my rough upbringing and the circumstances I had to live in, whether it was a homeless shelter or a crack house, I still was just a regular kid. Like what I would, I would like to go outside and play, you know, um, really just staying in my neighborhood, not really doing too much 
traveling or going places without my parents or getting myself in situations where I could get into major trouble. I was just a regular kid who just had a messed up um, set of circumstances. But once I started hanging around my older cousins, I started venturing out a little bit more. So now we might go hop on the public transit, and catch the bus from the CD, Central District of Seattle, to downtown Seattle. And we'd usually have a backpack with us and be up to no good. So, you know, they, my cousins, they were already stealing from stores, kind of people out of money, things like that. And these are the people that I looked up to. You're my older cousins. I don't have any brothers. Before, it was just me and my sisters when we're in Portland when we're with our mom. I'm coming up just around girls, you know. Um, it was it, there, I didn't have any any big brothers to look up to or any little brothers to even play with or anything like that. So once I got around my older cousins and it was an everyday presence, you know, they became who I looked up to. They became the people who I wanted to aspire to be like, follow around and things like that, you know. And they might not have been the best influences, but they were what I had. Had they been going, you know, to sign up for different programs or community activities or just something positive, going to play basketball at the YMCA, I would be right there with them doing that because this is what the people who I look up to are doing. But because instead, you know, we were like going and stealing from stores and just up to no good, you know, doing things that no young people have any business doing, you know, that's that's the path that I was led down because that's what they were into. So I started really hustling at a young age, you know, at nine years old. And it started out of necessity. It started out of, okay, my parents, they're trapped in their addiction. We're living in poverty. We're staying in homeless shelters. They're not really able to provide for me. They can't get me nice clothes. They can't get me nice shoes. They can't provide the things that I really need, you know, to be like these people who I aspire to be like. So it started out of that and it turned into greed, you know, because I would go steal a whole bunch of clothes, steal shoes. And I would now, okay, now, okay, I address that deficit. I turned to crime, it was out of necessity. I wasn't being provided for, but I met that need. It was clothes, okay? So I went and I stole clothes day after day after day. So I now had a whole bunch of clothes and a bunch of shoes and you know, was doing other little stuff where I might have some money in my pocket. But this became this insatiable desire where it doesn't matter how many clothes I get, how many shoes I get. What started as an, out of necessity, out of not having my needs met, it kind of morphed into greed over time where I always just wanted more and more and more. It became this insatiable desire. I was never going to be satisfied no matter how many clothes I got, no matter how many shoes I got, you know, it was never going to be enough. Like this, this whole stealing, going into malls, filling up backpacks with clothes, it became part of my lifestyle and crime and dishonesty became part of my character. And, you know, I was, ex I was first exposed to that from my parents, you know, um, going with my mom and stepdad, one of the ways that they used to support their habit when we lived in Portland, they would go into big grocery stores. They would steal cigarettes, um, big cartons of cigarettes. They would steal packs of batteries, take them to a small corner store and sell them for drug money in order to get high. So at a young age, not only from my cousins, but from the people who are raising me, I'm exposed to crime and dishonesty as an acceptable means to get the things that you might want or need. So I had nothing really holding me back from doing the wrong thing. You know, I didn't really have any positive role models or any positive influences, or if I was to mess up or do something wrong, have somebody who would point out to me, oh no, Amari, you shouldn't do that. And then like, where'd you get all these clothes from? These are not you, or how you get all these, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of clothes. No one, you don't, know, you, you can't afford that stuff. You shouldn't do that. Instead, the uh, people around me tasked with caring for me, they probably would have been more happy. <laughs> you know, they, they would see, okay, Omari got clothes on his own. Like, yeah, keep doing that. You know, like, we ain't got to worry about it. Keep on doing whatever it is that you're doing. It seems to be working. So keep doing it. So I just described to you how it is when I'm with my mom, you know, and the influence that could have on a young person's life. When I'm with my dad, a lot of adverse childhood experiences and the influences of that. Then when I'm with my cousins, you know, which were which was another real big negative influence. Um, and don't get me wrong. These are great people. My mom and dad, they were great people. My cousins are great people. It's, it's not that they were bad people. It's that in the environment and circumstances that we come from, living in the ghetto, dealing with things like addiction and parents who are in addiction, this is just something, the way that this plays out sometimes. You're not really introduced to positive possibilities for yourself. So... A lot of time you think, okay, it's bad when you're with your, your family, but what about when you go to school? All young kids have to go to school. And school is this positive environment. 
where you can grow, you can develop, you can learn, and everything goes good at school for people, right? You just, um, you're around, you're around supportive teachers and school administrators and school counselors, and they really just want the best for you, and their actions bring out the best in you. That's what you would think when it comes to school. But for me, that was just not my experience at all. My experience with the K-12 system was just as damaging as my experiences um, living in poverty and homelessness with my family and having all the negative influences and people introducing me to crime and things like that. When I would go to class, I took everything that I experienced with me. You know, I, I wasn't able to live through these homeless shelters and crack houses and all of this hardship, you know, not being fed properly, not being clothed properly. I wasn't able to live with those circumstances outside of school and then just show up to school as if none of that was happening. Just show up to school as a perfect kid who just shut up, sit, sits down in their seat and kind of falls in line and does what the teacher says. A lot of the time when individuals experience childhood trauma, a lot of childhood adversity, like even if they don't have ADHD, their behaviors in the classroom could look a lot like ADHD. A kid who only had three hours of sleep the night before or wasn't really um, properly fed, didn't eat a good breakfast or, you know, witnessed or experienced some traumatic type of things the night before the morning of, you know, the, the morning before they went to class, they, they're not going to come into the classroom just functioning like the rest of the kids. So I was always blurting out, standing up out of my seat. I wouldn't want to sit for long periods of time. You know, I would, I would be pretty disruptive when I was in class. And it wasn't because there was something wrong with me, but nobody was ever asking the questions about what I might be going through. What, what, what does it look like at home? What, what, what's my, my home situation like? Is there stability and things like that? Instead, what would happen is I would always have to be removed from the environment. So my teachers would constantly kick me out of class and remove me, whether I'm getting sent to the principal's office or to some other administrator's office or to sit in another class. Every single time that this happened, it kind of took away a piece of my motivation to even be there. And we're talking about way back in elementary school. You know, I, my, my experiences and my memories related to the K through 12 system were pretty much mostly and always negative. I didn't feel like my teachers really cared about me, that they really cared about my well-being or wanted to see me thrive. I really felt like they hated me and that I didn't belong there and that I was someone they wanted to remove. I remember things like a teacher calling me an asshole, you know, to another teacher, and things like that. So, I just, I was really turned off from school from my experiences. You know, I can tend to do that to you. If, if, you're, if you're feeling, if the feelings that your interactions with teachers and things, if it's leading to self-doubt, negative self-worth, low self-esteem, and you're feeling like one of the dumb kids in class, you feel like you don't have any purpose with school, then you kind of just lose your drive and your motivation for school. So like I say, it wasn't just my home situation. Like they say, it takes a village, right? You know, it, it takes a, a, a whole network of service providers and resources and doctors and teachers and just everyone in your community to, to build up a child. But for me, it seems like every step of the way, they were just piling on more negativity. And it kind of climaxed for me in the sixth grade when I was expelled from Seattle Public Schools. You know, I this was one of the few times I was actually innocent too. When I was expelled from Seattle Public Schools, I was accused of doing something that I didn't do. I wasn't guilty, but there was no one to advocate for me, no one to put up a fight for me. And I was kicked out of Seattle Public Schools. They said, you can't go, we're not just kicking you out of McClure Middle School. You can't just go to another school in our district. Your only option is to go to a re-entry program at an alternative high school. And for me, especially with me being innocent, like that was not a good thing. It led to me dropping out for the first time. So I first dropped out of school in the sixth grade at what, 11, 12 years old, you know, and what am I doing if I'm not at school? I'm in the streets hustling. That's what we call it the school to prison pipeline. They push you out of school and, you know, you spend your time engaging in criminal activity that otherwise might not have taken place had you been at school. So the more I was suspended, the more I was kicked out of class, and after getting expelled, the more I just began to hate school. The more I hated school, the more I skipped school, the more I just completely disengaged, the more I was into the streets and committing criminal activity. So as I got older, my situation didn't change much. I ended up going to over 15 schools growing up, dealt with chronic instability, constantly moving around, never really had anywhere to call home. 
um, switching neighborhoods, switching homeless shelters, might get a house that's not a homeless shelter, but it just doesn't last very long. We're constantly having to move and things like that. So by the time I'm a teenager, I, you know, my character is just, it's based on a lot of distorted perceptions. It's based on the things that I hear from hip hop music and that I witness in the hood and the ghetto, you know, seeing all the drug dealers and pimps driving up big shiny rims and getting all the girls and wearing gold chains. That's what I aspired um, to have and to be like. I didn't have any positive goals or, oh, I want to graduate from high school and go to college. No, I would have rather, you know, um, get it in the streets, you know, like the only, the only stuff that seemed tangible to me, that seemed real to me was what I was exposed to by my close circle. And nobody in my close circle like went to college or went to school or got a job in order to make a living. They were all hustlers, whether they sold drugs, whether they were pimps, no matter what it is that they did, it was always some sort of illegal activity. So for me, I know what I'm exposed to. I know what I'm close to. I know what I'm taught. You know, behaviors are learned. And it's really hard to transcend that and do things that you weren't exposed to, that you weren't taught. So by the time I'm a teenager and I'm introduced to this bank fraud scheme that is very widespread throughout in the, in the area, you know, and really across state lines, going into Oregon, California, and a lot of other states, there were a lot of young kids who grew up like me, dirt broke in poverty, who learned about this bank fraud scheme where it was a glitch in the system where you can deposit checks with an ATM card. And even if there was no money in the bank from the ATM card, no money in, no money in the bank where the check came from, the bank would still clear the check and money would magically appear. And we're talking about like thousands of dollars at, at a time. So once I learned that I can make thousands of dollars just in one day, you know, I felt like, okay, this is my path to success. I'm seeing cousins and stuff, relatives that grew up dirt poor, now driving Mercedes Benzes. And they're like, they're, they're what I consider a baller, right? Like, so they're, um, this is what I aspire to be like. So when I, when I see that they were able to be what I thought was successful off a of bank fraud, I decided to jump right in. And I had a few year run with this where I made a whole lot of money. And now I'm driving Mercedes Benzes and BMWs. And I got all the nice clothes, getting my own places to live. Finally got my own first apartment, was able to move out of my mom's little two bedroom with like 10 of us living there. I was able to, um, you know, in my, in my eyes, I had made it like this was the definition of making it always running around with a pocket full of money, having nice big rims on a nice car, gold chains, getting girls. This was my definition of success. So little did I know my definition of success was based on a very distorted perception. My definition of success was based on a character that had been deteriorated of values that were not any good, that were not going to lead to anything positive. So basically, my definition of success, my path to success was really a path to destruction and failure. You know, there's a lot of people who grow up the way that I grew up, and they often turn to crime, you know, because the, once again, they know what they're introduced to. They know what they're close to. It's about proximity. What are the people close to you doing? What are their methods? What are they teaching you? And a lot of people who grew up the way I did, what they were introduced to was selling drugs. And you can sell drugs every single day, you know, kind of like I did these bank fraud schemes, kind of as a, as a lifestyle. You're committing felonies every single day as a lifestyle. But even though you may have made hundreds of transactions selling drugs, there's 365 days in a year. And not a lot of drug dealers are taking days off. And they don't just make one transaction in a day. So the average drug dealer is actually committing over a thousand felonies, um, you know, in a, in a year easily. But when it finally catches up to them, it's for that one time they sold to an undercover or that one time they were riding with drugs in their possession and they got pulled over by the police and their car got searched and the drugs were found. But for me, I was leaving a paper trail with these felonies that I was committing every day. I'm writing checks with my own handwriting. I am walking up to ATM machines, face exposed to the camera, cashing checks in my, cashing money orders in my name, paying my rent with these money orders from this bank fraud scheme. And every single transaction I would make, every time I go to the ATM machine, every time I write a check, every time I pull money off of a card, I'm committing a new felony over and over and over and over and over. So by the time this stuff finally caught up to me, it wasn't just for one felony, like some of the people who might have sold drugs who grew up the way I did. 
it was for 30 felonies all at one time. So my first time ever facing a case in the adult system, I found out that I had a warrant for my arrest for 30 felonies. And when I found this out, I hired a lawyer, turned myself in, you know, wanted to do the right thing. There was a little bit of a time period between finding out about the warrant, identifying the lawyer, hiring the lawyer, having them set up the court dates, things like that, having a few discussions and actually walking into the courtroom. It was probably a couple months, but I did the right thing. I found out, you know, actually, I actually stopped doing the bank fraud schemes before I found out about the warrants, before I found out that I was wanted on 30 felonies. What made me stop doing this stuff was people who I knew and was familiar with, who I knew did nothing different than I did, started making the news and they started talking about multi-million dollar identity theft rings and things like that. So I was like, whoa, this is this is not um, what I thought I was getting myself into, multi-million dollars. So clearly they're tying a lot of people's stuff together. They're trying to make this um, something that it's not. I'm done. There's no way I'm about to get caught up in that. So I thought I had a, a clean getaway, you know, I had uh, stopped committing these crimes and it was a matter of about eight months between me stopping and finding out that I had a warrant for these 30 felonies. So when I turned myself in, you know, I thought I had action at walking out of the courtroom that day. People were telling me, look, you've never been in trouble before. You don't have any record. You don't have failure to appears and things like that. So when you walk into the courtroom, the judge is either going to give you a low bail or they might just PR you, which means release you on personal recognizance where you agree to come back to court at a later date. But for me, I was hit with a six-figure bail and labeled a flight risk. You know, they, they, they decided, look, this is somebody who we don't want to be free out into the, in the community while they fight their case. This is someone who we need to be incarcerated while they're fighting their case. Sorry, one second, water break. So I walked into that courtroom thinking I might have action at walking out that same day. But what ended up happening was I was stuck for the next eight and a half months with a six figure bail, being told that I'm looking at decades in prison for leading organized crime, which I hadn't been charged with at the time. So my lawyer, after eight and a half months, after eight months sitting in the county jail, not being offered any type of plea agreements. Um, being told you're looking at decades of prison, you're charged with so many felonies that can hit you with an exceptional sentence. You know, uh, there, there's no, they're not offering any plea agreements. I'm just going to court, coming back to my cell, going to court, coming back to my cell, nothing really happening. So after eight months, my lawyer comes to me and he says, the best way out of this situation is if you plead guilty as charged to all 30 felonies you were charged with. And my life was in his hands. I didn't have anyone else fighting for me. No one else I could ask questions to. No one else advocating for me. You know, but if you know anything about this criminal justice system that we have here, when you're charged with multiple felonies, the whole reason you take a plea agreement is so that you're not, they'll reduce that. You know, they'll drop some of those felonies that you're not actually having to plea as charged. You know, so you get charged, you might get charged with a certain amount but your plea agreement is going to involve dropping several of those and recommending lesser time than what your maximum is. But for me, the prosecutor, for whatever reason, just wanted to make an example out of me. So my plea agreement was the guilty is charged to all 30 felonies you're charged with, and we won't file a leading organized crime charge, which hadn't been filed anyway. So I feel if they could have filed it, they would have filed it from the beginning. And also, um, they were going to be recommending the maximum. So of those 30 felonies I was charged with, the highest charge was identity theft in the first degree. And the prosecutor was recommending the maximum for that sentence, which was seven years in prison. Fortunately, my lawyer retained the right to fight for sentencing alternatives. So in, in the courtroom, um, he fought and got me what's called a drug offender sentencing alternative, which leads to a 36 month prison sentence with 36 months of probation. So in total, it's a six year sentence. Half of the time is served inside. The other half is served on community custody. But if I mess up at any time, that 36 months of community custody can convert to prison time. And I saw this as a major second chance, a major blessing. I figure, look, I was just being told I'm looking at decades in prison. And now this allowed me 
with, with you know with the 36 months of prison time this was non-violent so I was able to get half off for, for earned good time. This man only served 20 months total. I had a release date that very next calendar year after my sentence. So I saw this as a major second chance and a blessing that I did not want to throw away. So I released from prison at 23 years old. This was in 2008. I was 23 years old. I had a GED. I had no real work experience. I wasn't part of any programs. I didn't have any mentors, any guides, but I knew I didn't want to go back to that life of crime. I knew I didn't want to go back to prison. So what do people do when they're not committing crimes, when they're not putting themselves in position to go to prison? They end up going to get a job. And, you know, I was able to, based on my qualifications, you know, which I didn't have any, I was able to get a job at the old country buffet. And at this time, I had two children already. The job paid minimum wage and had very limited hours. Um, it was pretty much a poverty trap. With the, with the position that I held at the Old Country Buffet, I felt like it was only a matter of time before I felt temptation and pressure to either find something new or go back to crime because I, you, I couldn't afford life, especially as a parent, on the salary that I was making at the Old Country Buffet in the role that I was in. So... I ended up deciding after a few shifts, like, look, this can't be it for me. This cannot be the alternative to hustling. You know, there has to be more out there for me. And I decided to pursue education as a way to close that gap. Like, if I wanted to go from that person who had no skills, no education, hardly even employable, except for a dead-end job, you know, um, I figured education could be that equalizer. It could help me close these gaps and get me to a position where I could be employable, where I can make a living wage, where I could do something in life that had meaning. You know, I didn't want to trade hustling for a life of misery and poverty, you know? Like, that's not appealing at all to turn away from a life of crime and a life that includes incarceration and hardship, but trade it for poverty and misery and never being able to afford your bills and, you know, relying on government assistance your whole life and things like that. That, that just was not appealing to me. So... That's why I decided to enroll at Pierce College. When I enrolled at Pierce College, you know, it kind of had a, it, it had this impact on me immediately. You know, where instead of, when I first got out of prison, I was always telling people, oh yeah, I'm fresh out of prison. You know, I got these felonies on my record. And, you know, always talking about what's in my way and my deficits and identifying myself with a lot of negative labels, you know, like a convict, a felon, things like that. But once I was a college student, the conversations changed. It was a little bit different. Instead of talking to people about my deficits and, you know, this hardship that I have been through and the fact that I'm a convicted felon, I'm now talking to people about the fact that I'm a college student and that I'm pursuing this degree and that I'm trying to become a drug and alcohol counselor. You know, and this had an immediate impact on people around me who are seeing, okay, Omari used to spend all day, every day, just grinding, hustling, making money and didn't really care about anything else. And now he's spending his time like actually going to class and doing his schoolwork, taking care of his kids. So my values had been completely transformed. And my lifestyle had changed. So my behaviors had changed. As a college student, I'm spending my time, once again, going to class, doing schoolwork, writing papers, you know, doing work on campus and things like that. And it really felt good to go from that life that I lived before that was always about hustling, chasing that next dollar to now, okay, I'm working towards something positive. I'm building something here. You know, like I, I would, when I worked at, I mean, when I was at the University of Washington Tacoma, I did a few different student jobs, like in advancement, events and conference services. I was a student media tech. I worked in the financial aid office. And these jobs didn't pay a whole lot more than the old country buffet. But for me, it really just, um, it felt a whole lot different. I felt like I was learning transferable skills like I was getting myself prepared for this future that I actually wanted for myself, you know? So the way it made me feel inside and having to dress nice, the interactions that I was having, and the fact that the work that I was doing, I felt like it was very meaningful, you know, it really just, it really did something to my identity. And it just allowed me to keep on pushing forward, knowing that I made the right decision because of the way I felt every day. You know, yeah, there was a lot of doom and gloom when I first walked out of those prison gates. So going to prison, I mean, um, go, going from prison to college, it kind of just changed my whole perspective on life, you know? And I, like I said, I was able to go from that associate's level. I started at the community college. 
I had no idea when I was at the community college that um, going to university was a possibility for somebody like me. I had no idea I could be a dropout who happened to luck into a GED and actually go to community college, earn a degree there, and then transfer to a university. I did, I did not know about that possibility. But once I did, it kind of you know, motivated me even further. Like, look, this doesn't even have to be where I stop. I can just keep going and keep going and really make myself competitive in the workforce, you know? Um, make, my, make it where if there's somebody who has never been to prison, who has never faced the hardship, who has experience and things like that, and we're competing for the same job, I might have some type of advantage, you know, through the educational journey that I took. So I was successful with that, you know, going and earning my associates, my bachelor's degrees, my master's degree. You know, when I graduated with my master's, I was hired by South Seattle College as a faculty member and a case manager, working with individuals who had been touched by the legal system, releasing from prison and on probation, teaching them life skills, um, how to navigate, obtaining, you know, things that they need to live their life in a positive way. So focus on education, finding resources, housing, employment, getting treatment if you need treatment, mental health counseling if you need mental health counseling, and just addressing any type of barriers that might have been in their way of success. And along the way, I'm able to share my experiences with them. I didn't have to hide. Like South Seattle College actually recruited me for this job. So I felt totally comfortable not having to hide my background. In fact, I had been incarcerated and turned my life around, you know, so I was able to use that to help motivate and inspire my students. I also ended up working for the ACLU of Washington as a juvenile justice researcher, you know, became a public speaker, started doing conference keynotes and, um, you know, just getting invited to share my story at a lot of different places. And ultimately, I ended up joining this Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau. I've been a faculty member at Tacoma Community College where I taught a student success seminar. And I've been in, engaged by several um, different outlets in our state, you know, just to seek my opinion and my perspective and my thoughts on different things, whether it's juvenile prisons, adult prisons, uh, you know, participating in different events with the governor and other leaders of state departments, things like that. I've been able to really find my voice and recognize that the things that I've come from, you know, that the major disadvantage, I was able to flip that around and make it a positive and actually make a career out of it. And right now, I work for a nonprofit called Choose 180, which works in like youth diversion, where youth and young adult diversion, individuals can catch low level offenses. Um, and come to our, instead of going to court, instead of going to jail, they come to our one day workshop, interact with us, and then get connected with mentors and resources who will follow up with them for the next year. And they're able to avoid that whole legal system. They're also in the schools, um, helping with kids who are getting suspended and expelled, making sure that, okay, you, this, this something just happened where you regularly would suspend this kid or expel them. Let's do some more restorative type practices. Let's, let's engage the teachers and all the people involved and see how we can keep this young person in school instead of sending them to the streets to be ate up by those streets. So the work that I do now, it's all related to where I've been, you know, the background that I come from. I'm, help, I'm playing a role in changing the narrative and introducing new possibilities for individuals from backgrounds similar to mine. You know, I've also published a few books. You can see here the cover of my book, Transforming Society's Failure. That's an autobiography. I've also published a couple of children's books, one called In Search of Role Models and the other titled Skin Deep. You know, I was named the 2018 Pierce College Distinguished Alumni Award winner. And, you know, where my life is today, I just would have never imagined that first part of the story that I told you and I'll share in the hardship. It often doesn't have this type of ending where I switched aside and just talk about my experiences releasing and how I went to education and, you know, have, have been able to make it work. You know, it's, it's a pretty um, when I graduated with my master's, it's, it's a story that we don't hear publicized a lot. When you hear about crime and people who've been to prison. It's more about like it's fear based. You're looking at them for their risk as opposed to their potential. So that's why I want to do my part in sharing my story so, so that people can see just because you've been incarcerated doesn't mean that you have nothing to offer society. So that's my story. Um, I actually went a little longer than I wanted to sharing that, but I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen, stop sharing my screen real quick and see if we have any questions. Uh, Steve Graham, a local attorney, 
was the DOSA curriculum in prison valuable at all? And what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I would say it was valuable. It was valuable to me, someone who didn't really have an addiction. Like me, when I was in there, I, I was, even though it's a drug treatment program and I got DOSA, I didn't really have an addiction, but I still had to do this inpatient treatment and also outpatient treatment based on having DOSA. But the aspects for me that were useful was like the behavior modification aspect, uh, looking at um, where you've been and where you want to go, you know, setting some goals for yourself, learning about things like defense mechanisms and a lot of things that you learn in drug treatment that are just transferable to people who may not have had a drug problem, but they're just trying to overcome any issues in their life, you know, um, recognizing your triggers and what, even though for some, they're, they're talking about triggers in the context of your trigger to want to go use. But for me, I'm, I'm more like, I have to personalize this and make it about hustling. You know, what are my triggers that might, when I get out of here, what might trigger me to turn back to a life of crime and, and hustling in order to provide for myself? So I really feel like if I had a drug problem, that program would not have fixed that. <laughs> it would not have addressed uh, my addiction. And to be honest, the way I was in a, a therapeutic community where even though we're inside a prison, everyone knows that there's this whole this whole thing about people who snitch, right? And the way that this program is set up, in order to progress through the program, they want you to snitch on other people who are in the program. So if they break a program rule, you have to fill out a slip with their name on it, drop it in a box, and they receive a consequence for that. In prison, that it was not a very well thought out concept. So what happens is none of us are really working the program. You get people, groups of people who are just trading these slips. So, okay, I'm going I'm to write one on you today. And then a week from now, you write one on me so that we can progress through this program, you know, because we're not going to really tell on people. We're not really, we're in prison. Like I, I saw fights and stuff that happened on the spot just from people thinking that someone was about to do that. So they didn't think it out too, too much. Um, I really think that model could be helpful for people who are totally bought in. Everyone who's in the, in the TC inside of prison is forced in here. You know, you're not here by choice. Like they, they tell you, you're going to join this. And a lot of the time you don't know just because you got DOSA doesn't mean you knew you were going to have to do a therapeutic community in prison. So there's a lot of people who get put into the therapeutic community and they just say, nope, I'm not doing this. And they cuff up right on the spot, move them out of the institution. And now, like how I mentioned, I had 36 months in and 36 months out. They are actually choosing instead of participating in this program that is associated with snitching and things like that in prison. I'm just going to do the extra three years. Like it, it, it sounds pretty baffling. You're gonna there's some people who might have an extra five years, you know, where it would have been a 10 year sentence with five years in, five years out. And some of these guys are choosing, give me the extra five years in prison before you ever associate me with snitching, just because it's dangerous. You can get seriously hurt for things like that. So um there were some positive aspects. I, I actually my my I wrote an op-ed in the Seattle Times that focused on an experience that I had there where I was in a class and I'm telling them when I get out, I'm gonna tap into this resource and that resource and I'm gonna do X, Y, Z and make sure I don't come back. And I was just met with a lot of negativity from my, the, the people in the class with me. A lot of them had been in and out of prison. So they're telling me, look, it's not that easy. That's not the way it happens. You're coming out to an unwelcoming society. Nobody's gonna to wanna to hire you. No one's gonna to wanna to give you a place to live. And the, the, the CDP, the chemical dependency professional who taught the class was kind of jumping on and co-signing with them and this is a program where you can't cuss, you can't, you know, disrespect period can get you one of those papers dropped in a box. But I stood up and cussed out the whole class, everybody who was going against me and kind of pointed out to them like this mindset, you telling yourself that you can't do it. You telling yourself that when you get out, everything is going to go wrong. That might be a major factor in why things are going wrong when you get out. So I, I, that, that was just something that really stood out to me, you know, um, that there are a lot of people who are in programs like this who they have a very pessimistic mindset, and it's based on life experience. It's based on being incarcerated, getting out, and nobody wants to give you a roof over here. When I say give you, not just give, you can have the money to pay for it, but they don't want you to be able to sign a lease and things like that. So that was a long answer to your question, but um, I don't usually get that question. It was a good one. Appreciate it. That was a great question, and that was a really interesting answer. Um, Maybe along the same lines, and maybe this, you know, may be a difficult subject to talk about. You 
what kind of advice would you, we, we talked earlier today about the advice you would give people who maybe were in the same position that you had been in. What kind of advice would you give the families of people who are incarcerated and who are, you know, maybe out and trying to put their lives back together again? You mean in, in terms of supporting the yes, incarcerated? Yes, yes. Yeah, just maintaining that connection, writing letters, letting them know that they're cared about. You know, if you see flyers or information that might be relevant to them, send it to them. You know, like that, that, that can really, one of the greatest times of day when you're in prison is when they call mail on, <laughs> you know, when, okay, there's people from the outside who have sent me something and I got to go get in line and pick up my mail. Everybody's happy in that line and smiling and it's a really great time of day. But there's a lot of people who are left out of that. There's a lot of people who don't have that family support or anyone sending them a letter. So they just get to watch everybody else go get in the mail line and get their mail and there's nothing coming for them. So that family support is huge. And it's about like visiting, you know, show up and visit, let them see your face and you can buy them all the junk food they want out the vending machine. And it's just going to give them something different in their day, you know, and they know, okay, when I get out, I have support because it's easy to feel like, I don't have anyone out there. I don't have any support. If you're not getting any letters, if you're not getting any visits, or if no one's able to pay for phone calls, phone calls can get really expensive when you're incarcerated. And if you don't have anyone out there who's willing to foot that bill, then it can feel pretty gloomy. You know, in order to release from prison in the state of Washington, if you're on probation, you have to have an approved address. Like you got to give them an address. They go visit the house. And if you don't have family connections, they might not let you out, you know, because I don't have an address to go to. So you can end up stuck in prison for longer than you had to be there. So I just say maintaining that connection, sending relevant information, sending song lyrics was huge for me. You know, things like that, just lyrics from a song that I love. Just get, it's not, I can't even hear the song, but when I get those lyrics and I'm reading it, it kind of really makes me feel good, especially if there's a positive message to that song. So there, there, there are things that um, individuals can do, and it all involves around maintaining connection. One more question um, over email is about how, what kind of, how, how can we do a better job as a community, uh, you know, in our communities of supporting those who are returning out of, you know, into regular society, out of incarceration? For sure. So, you know, the main, the main people that have been a barrier to success for individuals releasing from prison, whose intentions are good, their mindset is right, that they're set on not going back, not committing new crimes. They want to really just get out and build their, their self up. The main people in our society who are barriers to that are landlords slash property managers and people who make hiring decisions at various places of employment. So the big, the two of the biggest things that have to fall in place in order for someone not to return to prison, their finances need to be in order. They need to be able to make an honest living and they need to have a roof over their head. They need to have some type of stability. But unfortunately, when it comes to background checks, these are the two biggest things that we are denied systemically and on the regular and even irrationally. You know, there's individuals where the crime has nothing to do with the job that they're trying to do. But there's just this blanket policy. Oh, we're not we're not going to hire you if you had a felony conviction. We might hire you if you had a misdemeanor, but if you had a felony conviction, we're not going to hire you. The only difference a lot of the time between someone with a felony conviction and a misdemeanor conviction is they were charged with the felony, but their plea agreement lowered the charge. So same same act was committed. They just ended up with a better outcome. It's the only difference between someone with a felony conviction and someone with no record, period, a lot of the time is they didn't get caught. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of individuals who are in our society that have done similar things when it comes to the possession of a narcotic, for, for an example. We have a lot of very successful people who have been in possession of narcotics <laughs> from a young age, you know, since childhood, whether it was just marijuana, whether they started dabbling in hardcore drugs, whether it was just I'm in college and I'm partying and I tried Coke a couple times, you know, like it, it happens, right? Like it definitely happens with people who go on to be very successful, but there's other individuals where they might've dabbled and experimented and somehow they got caught in possession of that drug. And now they just have this label and this stigma where these property managers are not going to allow them a roof over their head or an employer is not going to provide an opportunity for, an empl for employment. 
So the biggest thing is just advocating, sharing stories, challenging these, ne these negative perceptions. You know, if you hear someone speaking about formerly incarcerated people and it's a fear-based narrative, kind of challenge that. Tell them about some stories you may have heard about positive individuals who have released and were able to make things happen for themselves. When I got out, it was a lot more difficult than it is today. In 2008, there weren't as many programs, there weren't as many organizations um, that were focused on changing things for this population. I've actually seen jobs in the past few years that prefer someone who had been incarcerated. Like they'll say that, that like, this is a, a preferred qualification is the fact that you had walked in these shoes before that you've been there. So just, just continue to show up and advocate, use your voice and challenge negative perception. Share a story. If you're on social media and you come across a news article where you know there's there's someone who did some something major in your community or in your state, or it might be across the nation, and they had that history of incarceration, just hit the share button. Because when you hit that share button, you're doing your part in challenging these negative perceptions. Amari, you've talked a lot about, I mean, shared with us tonight about your, your personal life story, you know, in a really broad sense, um, in, you know, talked about the, the specificity of your day-to-day -day life, even as a child, and during the time that you were incarcerated. And I guess a question I have for you before we close tonight, you know, it's been a kind of a terrible year looking back on the past 14, 15 months for people, mm -hmm. uh, the, the pandemic and, and just everything else that people have been going through. And in particular, I would point to the, you know, the riots and in response to police violence last summer, you know, for someone like yourself who has carved out this wonderful life for yourself, you know, what, it, what was it like having to witness that and, and bear witness to that? And how, how do you maintain a sense of hope going forward? For sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest problem with this stuff is these are not new issues. Like even though, like with the death of George Floyd, these things were really amplified nationwide because there were nationwide protests, people hitting the streets all around. You know, I live in the Tacoma area, Pierce County, and we had multiple situations similar to George Floyd with police killings right here in our own community that didn't kind of, that didn't spark the same type of outrage or the same type of organizing or the same type of um, community response until the death of George Floyd. So I really feel like for some people, it was more, let me jump on this bandwagon. Let me just get out the house during a pandemic. These are things that like, I'm, I'm gonna show, there's gonna be some more performative type of things, but I'm not really in this for the long haul. I'm not really in this to see systemic change. I'll throw on a t-shirt, I'll participate in some chants, but then I'm gonna go home to my comfortable life and I'm gonna post my pictures on social media and feel good about the fact that I was there. You know, um, And I'm getting some kudos, like I'm getting a lot of likes and people who are looking at me like, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my thing. But at the end of the day, where are the outcomes that are attached to this? So I feel like that, that this this stuff, my dad, my dad was a Black Panther. And um, they were fighting for the same things that we're still fighting for today, which is the end to police violence against Black people and end to, you know, over-policing in our neighborhoods and things like that. So for, for me, it was like, it was good to see people come out like in such high numbers and have such a light shed on these issues. But it was also a little bit discouraging because I'm like, is this real? <laughs> you know, it is it, the way people are saying they feel about this, the actions that are behind it, is it sustainable? Is this a movement or is it a moment? And unfortunately, I feel like for a lot of people, it was more of a moment than an actual movement. So it's, it's tough, but it makes me know, look, the work that I do when I'm mentoring youth, when I'm getting out here in the community, boots on the ground, it's just that much more important, you know? There might be someone else who gets all the awards, who gets all the, the recognition and the media attention and things like that. But I know that if I can be the different, a, a re, make a real life difference in the lives of individuals who can be at the other end of this, whether it's police violence, incarceration, dealing with parents and addiction, if I can somehow inspire them or provide hope, let them know, look, I feel you, I've been there, I can relate to you, I can empathize, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't tell you I know the thoughts that go into your head and what you deal with every single day, but I do have a similar story that I can share with you and I can share with you the ways that I've been able to overcome. You know, it just, it kind of, it kind of just showed me, look, Omari, you're doing the right thing. You're on the right track. 
And, and sometimes you can't see that right away. You know, um, when it comes to mentoring youth, especially youth who are at the far end of the spectrum, when we talk about being at risk for incarceration and gun violence and things like that, it can be easy to internalize that stuff. Okay, I was working with this kid and he just got locked up or he just got shot or whatever else. It can be easy to internalize that. But I just know, look, we all got a role to play and I'm going to just keep on playing mine and hope for the best, you know, because we need, I named my book Transforming Society's Failure because my failures were not my own. The failures of a police officer who kills an unarmed person is not that police officer's own failure. Like these are societal systemic issues that that are played out across the nation. You know, this, if it was about individuals, then we wouldn't see the same thing play out in so many different places the exact same way. You know, places that have different laws, different cultures, different structures, different resources, different opportunities. We're seeing the same exact issues, you know, nationwide. So, like I said, I just all, all I can do is keep on doing my part. You know, it does it does lead to some optimism when you see people gather in large numbers. The the, the pandemic, seeing people lose their jobs and people's lives, just really transformed the school system being transformed. I, I'll be honest, that gave me a lot of hope that maybe we can do things differently. I, I think there's a major problem with the K through 12 system as designed. And I feel like COVID provided an opportunity for that to be reimagined, rethought, redesigned, because there's so many kids that are not being educated correctly, that are kind of, they're not, they're not doing well with this virtual environment. There's other ones who are thriving, some who it's a great fit for, but there's others where it's not. So maybe they need to, while well, in the classroom, there's not always that focus on different learning styles and we need to do things different. Now, maybe that, that, that will come into focus now that a lot of kids have lost a year and a half of their education, you know? So it does, unfortunately, the pandemic had to happen, but I feel like there's opportunity in that as well, you know, to do things a little bit different, reshape some things and um, dismantle and redesign some of these systems that aren't quite working for everyone. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it really did. Thank you. I appreciate your insights and especially about you know, as, a, as an educator, I appreciate hearing your, your kind of critique of, you know, where we might um, be able to do better. And those are certainly things that we've been reflecting on here at our own institution since the, the pandemic is thinking about, you know, how can we, with the things that we've learned during the pandemic, how can we create a more equitable system at Spokane Community College that, that serves all students in a more equitable way. So thank you so much. Thanks for being with us tonight. I really appreciate it. And as um, our audience knows, and you said this is your last event as yep, a humanity. The last one for, for From Crime to the Classroom, How Education Changes Lives. But I will be with Humanities Washington until 2023 with a brand new presentation. That starts oh, wonderful, today. wonderful. That's this this one's called Life After Prison, the Prison to School Pipeline. That's great, that's great. I'm sure that we will have you back again um, Thank you so much, I guess I said, for being with us. Thanks to our audience. Thanks to Jonathan and Charlie tonight. Um, yes, thanks to everybody for supporting us all this whole season. And we've been really excited to, to, to bring this lineup of excellent speakers all year to our community. And as I said, we're looking forward to next year as well. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Have a great night.